كتاب الله دستور وخير الخلق أسوتنا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد الحمد لله uh, I'm really glad all of you were able to make it through this traffic I know I, I would I even had traffic walking over here I didn't even take a car but there was a lot of traffic mashallah and I pray that inshallah ta'ala our time together here is used wisely I know we're starting a little bit late but I don't think I'm going to cut my lecture short so I'm gonna I'm probably gonna need about an hour hour and a half uh, at the most I think to get across the few things that I wanted to talk to you about tonight inshallah ta'ala so who knows the topic tonight because I, I don't <laughs> anybody Oh, the final miracle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, something about Islam. Okay. So, what I wanted to first talk to you about tonight is uh, a, a problem. And the problem is that a lot of Muslims, increasingly in recent times, they get into debates with non-Muslims unnecessarily about the miracle of the Qur'an. About the fact that the Qur'an is, it can only be from Allah and they... They want to convey that to a non-Muslim and this is almost the first thing they talk to uh, with a non-Muslim about. Like, let me tell you about Islam and the first thing I'm going to tell you is look at how awesome the Qur'an is and let me tell you how many miracles it has in it and I can prove it to you and all of that. And it becomes like a back and forth debate. And this is a very problematic approach for many reasons and one of them is in debates, Nobody ever goes into a debate to listen to the other side or to be interested in what the other has to say. When you go into a debate, you go into it to crush your opponent. So even if you are defeated, even if you are defeated, you are going to be thinking, how do I come back tomorrow and beat him back up? How do I get back up with a response? How do I come up with a counter? You don't listen to something that defeats an argument and say, okay, you know what? I agree. I accept what you have to say. There's, uh, there's a pride that comes inside the human being. It takes over and it doesn't let you accept in a debate form. Whether it's the truth or falsehood doesn't even matter. And the idea of starting the message of Islam with somebody, introducing them to the message of Islam with a conversation which will naturally turn into a debate is a problem. That's not a good approach to take with anybody. And certainly this is not, a, the, not the approach of the Qur'an. Now a few places in the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal issued a challenge and I think all of you here are familiar with the challenge. You know, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ If you're in any doubt about what we've sent down, bring a surah like it. But you know that ayah came down in Medina. The ayah came down in Medina. And actually at the best in late Meccan revelation. In other words, the Qur'an did not come down in the beginning and the Prophet ﷺ went around to people and said, Look, if you don't think this is the truth, bring a surah. Bring a surah. It didn't work like that. Da'wah is not you go, you set up a table and non-Muslims walk by. Hey, hey, come here. Bring me a surah. <laughs> What's a surah? You know, I just came to eat some free pizza. What's the surah business? You know, it's the wrong approach. And what it does is that actually it creates an interest in non-Muslims to want to refute the arguments of the Muslims. To try to constantly undercut the arguments of the Muslims. Here's the second problem and a more important problem. Allah Azza wa Jal revealed to us this most powerful book, which truly is a miracle. It cannot be from a human being. And I, I'll talk to you about my personal journey in that conclusion, inshallah ta'ala, in tonight's talk. But before I do, what I think is miraculous about the Qur'an or what I studied and I found that this is so incredible, this is so, this is so beyond the capability of a human being, is my understanding. That's my understanding. I cannot tell someone this is why the Qur'an is a miracle. Because I'm only talking about my understanding. All I can say is to the best of what I can appreciate, this is what I love about the Qur'an. This is, what it, this is what makes it beautiful to me. You may see it and you may not see it. 
Because my understanding is not the reason that the Qur'an is a miracle. The Qur'an is a miracle for reasons beyond my understanding. It is powerful beyond what I can know and what I don't know. It's, for, for, it's bigger than me. So if I only associate the miracle of the Qur'an with my particular understanding, then we're actually limiting the miracle of the Qur'an. And it can't be limited. We cannot limit it. And if somebody disagrees with my... Is it possible, by the way, is, my, is it possible that my understanding is incorrect? Is that possible? Sure. So if somebody proves me wrong, they should not think that they proved the Qur'an wrong. There's a difference between those two things. There's a difference between them. So I can share with you the best of my understanding and still maintain that my understanding may be limited, but the word of Allah is perfect. We have to maintain the distinction between those two things. Now, having given you that brief introduction, I want to talk to you now about why should we appreciate the miracle of the Qur'an anyway? What difference does it make? After all, we're already Muslim. Or I think at least most of the people in the audience today are Muslim. So you're already believers. You already believe in the word of Allah and it can, it's not from a human being. These are, this is not the authorship of Muhammad wasallam. These are the words of Allah. Then what's the point? Why even discuss this point? Why even discuss this issue? I have two things to share with you on this subject. The first of them is a conversation about one of the people in the Qur'an, one of the dialogues of a person in the Qur'an, who when we think about Iman, we think about him. Ibrahim alayhi salam. وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى Ibrahim alayhi salam said to Allah, Ya Allah, show me how do you bring life to the dead? How do you do that? Now, Allah Azza wa asked him a very strange question in response and a very reasonable one. He said, Awalam tu'min? So you don't already have iman? You didn't believe yet? You didn't, you didn't have iman? Because why would somebody ask, show me how, until they already have iman? But the response of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and Ibrahim, you can think about the iman of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Where am I and where are you and where is the iman of Ibrahim alayhi salam? And he says to Allah, Bala, of course, why not? No, 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 I have Iman. Because I just want to satisfy my heart. I want to put my heart at ease. In other words, when a Muslim, even a prophet, a messenger, sees a miracle of Allah, when they see that, there's something that happens to their heart. They become, they become tranquil. The heart becomes at ease. And this is a very powerful thing that Allah told us in this ayah. The Muslim should study the miracle of the Qur'an and appreciate the miracle of the Qur'an because then the heart, not the mind, you see? We think that those, we're studying the miracle to satisfy our minds. Now we're intellectually convinced that it's a miracle. But the ayah is about our hearts. It's a spiritual reality. When you appreciate the miracle of the Qur'an, you will appreciate the greatness of Allah. You're, the, the grandeur you have of Allah, the next time you say Allahu Akbar, it's going to feel different. It's not going to feel the same way. You know, I tell my children the story of Musa alayhi salam and the water parted. It's an amazing story. They're walking through the water. And I can make them try to imagine it. But it will never be, it will never be the same as somebody who was actually walking through and looking on both sides and he's seeing Tawd Azim, he's seeing like mountains raised of water on both sides. That person's Iman is something else right then. Because they are living and they're tasting, they're experiencing a miracle. So the Qur'an, we want to taste its miracle. We want to at least appreciate something about it that we haven't before. Now I'll talk to you about something personal, about myself, and then we'll get into the examples that I, I wanted to share with you. I have five or six examples, I hope I get through all of them with you tonight, inshallah. I, I, I feel like I'm leashed, can somebody help me turn, oh this is on, look at that, I can walk around. Awesome, okay. I was, I was tapping this the whole time the nasheed thing was going on, okay, so. So now, personally myself, the first thing that made me curious about the Qur'an was its message. Like, what is Allah saying? Right? What, are, what is Allah's advice to me? What is Allah's guidance for me? So the first aspect of my relationship and your relationship with the Qur'an, I would argue, is its message. Its message. 
This is what made me curious about learning the Arabic language. This is what is curious about this curiosity made me listen to lectures about the about the Quran, read tafsir. I got into this study because I was curious about the message itself. But then, this is a few years ago. This is maybe 2003. I came across a lecture series in the Arabic language, and my Arabic was not very strong at the time. So I just started listening to Arabic lectures and I would understand maybe 30%. But I still forced myself to listen and just kind of take notes and stuff. So I listened to uh, Tariq Suedan's I'jaz al-Qur'an in Arabic. May Allah reward him. So he did about a 16, 17 hour series on the miracle of the Qur'an. And this was the first time I heard a topic, the miracle of the Qur'an. And when I listened to it and I started taking notes, again, I only understood about what? How much? About 30%. But when I took notes, I, would, I, was list, I was hearing things I've never heard before in my life. I've never ever come across some of this stuff in my life, ever. And I was blown away that this, this subject even existed. Because until then, the only thing that interested me about the Qur'an was its what? Message. But now there was another conversation. What about its miracle? What about its miracle? And actually the word miracle is not used in the Qur'an. The word miracle is not used in the Qur'an. We use the Arabic phraseology, the terms we use are I'jaz al-Qur'an. I'jaz al-Qur'an. You know, I'jaz in Arabic comes from ajaz. And ajaz in Arabic is to be on your knees. To not be able to get up. When someone says, ana ajaz in Arabic, that means I'm incapable. I am incapable. So, ana mustati'a, ana qadir, I'm capable. Ana ajaz, I'm incapable. Now, i'jaz means something that makes something else incapable. Like if two people are wrestling each other and one guy steps on the other one's face and he can't get up now, the one who's standing on top of the other guy, he's mu'jiz. He's mu'jiz. And the guy that got stepped on, he can't even get up now, he's mu'jaz. That's, that's the Arabic of it. Okay? I'll give you another example of i'jaz. If you're crossing the street, well, hopefully not you. Somebody's crossing the street, there's a truck coming by. They didn't notice the truck. They didn't notice the truck. And then look for a second and the truck is like one foot away from you. Your eyes go wide open. You realize you got nowhere to go. That, that second before you turn into like pancake, that one second you experienced i'jaz. You were overpowered. You were completely overpowered. The discussion in Islamic history is the Quran's power to overpower its opponents. The Qur'an is so powerful that somebody who tries to oppose it, somebody who tries to attack it, somebody who tries to come up with something else like it, is always made incapable. They keep falling on their knees. It brings its enemies to its knees, to their knees. That is the idea of i'jaz. That's not the same as miracle. The word miracle is used in strange ways in English. It's not, it's not the same. But since it's a popular term, I even chose it in the title. Because if I said the Qur'an's power to bring its opponents to its knees, it would have been a long title. And by the time, <laughs> I don't know how you fit that on a flyer, you have to go all around the page or something. I don't know. Right? So, <laughs> I didn't choose that title. But now, for me personally, I started studying this subject and I started taking notes. I still remember, I started just kind of taking examples down on what's being talked about and how it's a miracle. In what sense is it a miracle? And sometimes I would study these examples and I would have to stop taking notes. And I would just have to go in a corner and cry. I'd be overwhelmed by what I was reading and what I was researching. And I would say to myself, how come I never knew this? How come, how come I never knew this? Every time I, talked about, I heard about the Qur'an, I heard about it as a message. And I never got a, I appreciated it as a miracle, as something that's overpowering. I felt overpowered. I felt like, Ya Rabbi, yeah, okay, okay, Ya yeah, yeah Allah. I just went and fell into sajda and prayed or like tickled a baby or something. I couldn't study anymore. I had to stop studying because it was overwhelming. It really was. When I put enough of my notes together, I decided to actually turn it into a course. When enough of my notes came together on this subject. I used to call that course Divine Speech. And I taught it in the United States about, I think, 60 or 70 times all across the United States. And I taught it once in the UK also, in, the, in, in London. And from the times, the 50 times that I taught it in the United States, from what I know, 17 people took shahada at the program itself. 
These are non-Muslims that came, college university students, professors, working professionals, friends of Muslims that came and attended and by the end of it, <laughs> you know, they just, they just took shahada. And it's not because of me, because I know this stuff is super powerful. And before I share some examples with you, I'll share one more story with you. I was in Los Angeles. The first time I taught divine speech was in Los Angeles. And this mother, you know, I used to teach on a Friday night and all day Saturday and all day Sunday. That's what I used to do. And when I was done teaching on Sunday, this mother came up to me and she was crying. And I said, what did I say? Sorry. And she said, no, no, I want to talk to you for a second about my son. And I said, okay, tell me about your son. She says, well, you know, when you had the program on Friday night, uh, he didn't want to come, my 17-year-old son. He, didn't, he wasn't interested. And I said, that, it's understandable. When I was 17, I wasn't interested in Islamic lectures either. And she goes, well, no, he had Lakers tickets. Front row seats. You know who the Lakers are? If you don't know who the Lakers are, make a stifar right now. Okay, so... so <laughs> but anyway... So he has front row seats to the Lakers and his mother says, go attend an Islamic lecture with me. And you know what? Before I go on, I have to tell you, I don't know how many mothers have come up to me or the, how many youth have come up to me. My mother makes me listen to your lectures. <laughs> and I just said, I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> There's so many young people who have a grudge against me because they're mothers. <laughs> Listen to Brother Allah. Oh, like, I hate that guy. He's ruined my life. <laughs> but anyway, so she says, I could not convince him. Finally, I told him, I will get you playoff tickets. Just come tonight. And playoff tickets are expensive. He said, Fine, it's a deal. I'll come. So he came. And he came and he actually stayed Friday. He came Saturday on his own and Sunday on his own. And when they were leaving, Friday night, when they were going back home, and this, is, this kid just missed the LA game. He's talking to his mother, he says, Mom, today was actually the first time I believed that the Qur'an is not from human beings, it's from Allah. It can't be from a human being. Today was the first time. This was a Muslim child talking to a Muslim mother, and they didn't convert to Islam, they were born and raised Muslims, right? Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because this subject is important for us today. A lot of us have Islam, as I was mentioning in the khutbah at the university, a lot of our Islam is given to us by our parents, by the society in which we live, but we didn't feel it ourselves. We didn't taste it ourselves. We don't know why. We're told it's a miracle, but we don't know why. When I was younger, I heard hundreds of times I heard, the Qur'an is a miracle. The Qur'an is perfect. Its Arabic is amazing. The poets could not come up with anything to respond to the... Have you heard this before or no? You heard this, huh? And I used to say, wow. That's all, it's Quran so awesome. Why is it awesome? Because it's Arabic is awesome. Oh wow. But I, I don't know Arabic. Well, too bad for you. <laughs> it's still awesome. Okay. I was like, I guess it's if, um, until you know Arabic, you can't you can't see it. You know? It's like telling someone something behind this glass door. It's 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 frosted glass, it's stained glass, you can't see through it. Behind this door is something amazing. Can I see it? No. <laughs> you? Look at you, go learn Arabic first, then you can see it. That's the attitude. But the problem with that approach is, do you think most people are going to learn Arabic for five years, six years, seven years, even one year, even six months, just so they can see the miracle of the Qur'an? Most people won't do that. We have to present this message in the language of the people. And we have to stop saying, until you learn Arabic, <laughs> too bad for you. No, 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 no. And personally, I do believe that the true miracle, to, be, to taste the miracle of Allah in this book, you have to have something of the Arabic language. But it's, I made an obligation on myself. Whatever of it I can explain in English, I will. Whatever I can, if, if I can't make you taste 100%, even if I can make you taste like 2%, it's better than nothing. And it's a lot. It's a lot. And the more I studied this subject, wallahi, 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 the more I said, man, people need to know this stuff. People need to appreciate what Allah's book is, what it says. Now me personally, I am a student of language. I'm interested in linguistics. 
I'm interested in grammar and nuances, literature, literary analysis. So I studied the Qur'an from a language perspective. And so tonight what I'm going to share with you is something unique about the Qur'an from the language perspective. From its language. Not from the scientific perspective, not from the legal perspective, not from the theological perspective. Those are good perspectives. They have their place. But that is not the perspective I'll share with you today. I want to share with you today about just how Allah says certain things. Is that clear to everybody? Okay. So I'm going to try to do maybe six or seven examples with you guys of different dimensions of, of, of this thing. And my intention, inshallah ta'ala, I've made the intention, make dua that it happens. My intention is hopefully next summer if my wife doesn't kill me, I am going to come with my family and hopefully I'll teach all of divine speech here. Inshallah ta'ala. That's my intention. Inshallah ta'ala. Okay. So, first example. How do I explain this one? You know, you ever seen like a cob of corn? Right? That co and, and corn and some other plants also, they have this cover and you have to peel it. And when you peel it, there are grains inside. You know what I'm talking about? That cob is called, in Arabic, it is called sumbula. And in order for me to make sure you understand what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to make you repeat some things, okay? What is it called? Sumbula. Sumbula. That is an ear, like the whole bud. Of, of grains inside. It could be corn, it could be other things. But when you peel it and it's got a lot of seeds inside, a lot of little, little dots and grains inside, that is called a sumbula. Okay. Now, if I say in English car, what's the plural? Car. Cars. House. House. Mouse. Mice. Mouses. <laughs> no? <laughs> no? Okay. Mice. Okay, but usually in English, when you have a word, you give it a plural by adding what? An S. It usually works. I mean, it doesn't work with, you know, house and house and houses. It works, but mouse, I don't know. You know, but I might as well tell you a joke in the meantime. If you don't laugh, then you have to leave. Okay, so when I was I was studying economics, and I don't know why I was doing that, but I was studying macroeconomics when I was in college, and our professor was. Uh, a Chinese fellow, he was, uh, he was doing his PhD in New York City and he was, he was a macroeconomics professor and he spoke in a very heavy Chinese accent. And there were 300 students in the class. I mean, this is some of the best sleep I ever had in my life. <laughs> but in any case, so he used, to, he used to give his lecture and when he would give his lecture, like, you really try to listen, you didn't understand until he said, exam tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, so the entire class, 300 students, we wrote a petition to the department, please, we cannot take an exam, we don't understand what this man is saying. <laughs> so, he got very upset. He got angry at the entire class. So the next day he came to class and he said, he, you know, he put a PowerPoint on the screen and he said, Professor Wang's list of complaints against English. He says, you complain about my English, I complain about English. <laughs> so he said the English language doesn't make any sense You, you know, and especially in, in the US we, we say things like you park on a driveway And you drive on a parkway Right? So, <laughs> you know, and, and the plural of house is what? No, the plural of mouse is what? Mice, but the plural of house is not heis And, and, and tooth is teeth. teeth But booth is not Beef, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he had a whole list of these complaints, you know. And he went through. He took forty-five minutes and went through all of them, right? It was the best economics class I have ever had in my life. But anyway, the point I was going to make to all of you was: car is cars. Sumbula, sumbula is singular. Sumbulat, say that. Sumbulat. Sumbulat that's plural. That is plural. But the Arabic language is kind of cool because you can have more than one plural. It's weird. Like in English, you don't have cars and cars is, is. You don't have that. You have book and books. You don't have book and books and books is, 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 is. You don't do that. But the Arabic language actually has multiple plurals for one word. I'll give you an example that you know. Kafir? Kafirun? Any other, any other plurals you know? Kufar. 
Nabi, you can say Nabiyun, you can say what else? Anbiya. You have multiple plurals. It happens all the time in Arabic. So in the Arabic language, Sumbula is singular. What was the plural? Sumbulat. And there's another plural, Sanabil. Sanabil. Now this is vocabulary I'm teaching you without any notes. And if you're brothers, you're not taking notes anyway. But if you're sisters, probably chances are you're writing something down. It's okay. <laughs> but Sumbula is singular. Now I'm going to hear from the crowd. What was the singular? Sumbula. What was the plural? Sumbulat. What's the other plural? Sanabil. Now here's the secret. In the Arabic language, they have a concept. I kid you not. This is real. In the Arabic language, they have a concept that you can have singular, you can have plural, and you can have super plural. Literally, super plural. They have singular and plural and super plural. Sumbula is singular. Sumbulat is plural. Sanabil is what? Super plural. So the more powerful plural is which one? Sanabil. You with me so far? Now let's turn to the Quran. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the ear of grain, Sumbula, but He mentions the plural. He says, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَنْبَتَتْ سَبْعَ سَنَابِلْ سَبْعَ سَنَابِلْ Is that the regular plural or the super plural? I don't remember, you have to tell me. That's a super plural, okay. When you turn to Surah Yusuf, it's the only other time the plural is used. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَقَالَ الْمَلِكِ إِنِّي أَرَى سَبْعَ بَقَرَاتٍ سِمَانٍ يَأْكُلُهُنَّ سَبْعٌ عِجَافٍ وَسَبْعَ سُمْبُلَاتٍ خُضْر سُمْبُلَاتٍ What was that? Was that the regular? Was that the singular, the plural, or the super plural? What was that? Ah, so the weak plural is used in Surah Yusuf. And the strong plural is used in Surah Al-Baqarah. And you know what's crazier? What's crazier is in Baqarah, Allah is talking about seven of them. Sab'a Sanabil. Sab'a Sanabil, seven of them. And in Surah Yusuf, Allah is also talking about seven of them. Sab'a Sumbulat and Khudr. Seven of them both times. So the number is equal. This is seven and that is seven. Then how come one is more powerful and one is weaker? You would say if one is 75 and the other is 7, okay, I understand this one's more powerful and this one is weaker. But mathematically speaking, both of them in number are what? They're the same. Now in English translation, it says 7 ears of grain in Surah Al-Baqarah. And in the English translation, when you go to Surah Yusuf, what does it say? 7 ears of grain. The translation is identical. There is no difference in translation. But Allah chose to use the powerful plural in Baqarah and the weaker plural in Surah Yusuf. How come? How come? When you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says those who spend, the example of those who spend for the sake of Allah, in the path of Allah, is like a single seed. And every seed gives birth to seven ears of grain. And inside every grain, فِي كُلِّ سُمْبُلَةٍ مِئَةُ حَبَّةٍ Inside every grain, there are another hundred, inside every ear, there are hundred seeds. وَاللَّهُ يُضَاعِفُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ And Allah multiplies on top of that for whoever He wants. The context of the ayah is you will take one, you will turn it into seven, every seven will give you another hundred each, and on top of the math that you can do for each of those, seven times one hundred, times seven, times one hundred, for each of those, and you keep going, you keep going like that, on top of the math you can do, Allah has His own calculations. Wallahu yudha'ifu li man yasha. Allah multiplies in His own way, above and beyond that, for whoever He wants. Meaning this calculation is beyond human capability. Is this a context of weakness or power? Is this a context of less or more? So the powerful plural is used. When you turn to Surah, Al- Surah Yusuf, the king sees a dream. You remember the dream? Fat cows, skinny cows, seven years of corn. And the dream is interpreted. And what does the dream mean? You will have seven good years and then you will have seven bad years. Is the seven good years going to give you unlimited resources or limited resources? Limited resources and you have to use them carefully and you have to store them because you will need them for the next seven years. So you cannot be careless 
with the seven years of grain example, it's going to be less, it's not going to be too much, so you have to ration. Is this a context of more powerful or weaker? Weaker, in the weaker context Allah used sumbulat, in the more powerful context Allah used sanabil. It's the same word, it's the same number. Surah Yusuf is a Makki surah, Surah Al-Baqarah is a Madani surah. So the ayat are years apart on the tongue of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Years apart. When he recited Sab'a Sumbulat in Surah Yusuf, it was years ago. And when he recited Sab'a Sanabil in Baqarah, it was years later. Can you imagine that he will think to himself, hmm, years ago I said Sab'a Sumbulat. Maybe I should say Sab'a Sanabil here, it fits better. Is that capable? Are we capable of doing that as human beings? SubhanAllah. Just the way Allah describes a single word. A single word. I want to give you one more example of the regular plural and the, the, the singular and the plural and the super plural. Just one more example of that. Because it's a fun concept. And it changes your perspective on even one word. How is it being translated? How is that being translated? The word is ni'mah. Probably a word you know. Ni'mah. What does ni'mah mean? Commonly translated. Anybody? Blessing. It's okay. You don't have to be afraid. Blessing. Should I say it out loud? <laughs> what if he finds out I said it? <laughs> Don't do that. So you can call it out. It's okay. It's okay. You, you, you came to one of my lectures, which means you should be ready to be embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so, ni'ma means what? Blessing. Blessing. The plural of ni'ma is an'um. An'um. I want you to say it. An'um. An'um. Okay, so ni'ma is singular. An'um is plural. And then the powerful plural, the super plural, the jam'u kathra, they say in Arabic principles, is ni'am. Ni'am. Okay? So you have ni'ma, and you have an'um, and you have ni'am. It's pretty cool in the Quran, only one time Allah used an'um. And only one time Allah used ni'am. That's it. But one time the weak plural, one time the power, super plural. And what's even cooler is when you're reading the English translation, will they make a distinction between the weak and the powerful plural? Or will they just say blessings? It'll just say blessings, you won't even know there's a difference. You won't see a difference in the translation. Okay. Allah Azza wa Jal talks about Ibrahim alayhi salam. Very powerful. Describing Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah says, Shakiran li an'umihi. Did you hear the plural? Shakiran li an'umihi. Was that the weak? Or the strong plural? Oh, that's a test. Allahu Akbar. What should you say? That's the weak plural. Very good. Some of you are good listeners. Alhamdulillah. Two of you answered that one. That's fantastic. An'um is the weak plural. And it was used for Ibrahim alayhi salam. It is as though Allah is saying he was grateful to the few favors of Allah. But that sounds wrong. That sounds strange. When we think of Ibrahim alayhi salam, we think of him as thanking Allah for what? Many favors. But the ayah says he was grateful to Allah for few favors. If Allah wanted to say many, many, many favors, he would have said shakiran li ni'amihi. But he didn't say that. He said shakiran li an'umihi. There's a very powerful lesson in this. Very powerful lesson before I go to the other ayah. The lesson in that is, no matter, even if you're Ibrahim alayhi salam, and you are grateful to Allah from beginning to end, and you are grateful in the way that, that few human beings will ever, ever be, ever be on the face of this earth. At the end of your life, when you look back and you thank Allah for the favors that He gave you, you were only able to accomplish thanking Allah for just a few, in pers- in, with respect to the actual number of favors He did. Human beings are not capable of thanking Allah in proportion for the majority of his favors. At the end of our lives, when we turn back, if, if, even if my entire life was about shukr, I will only have accomplished a minority of shukr. It will be an'um, not ni'am, that I was able to actually thank Allah for. As a matter of fact, most people can't even truly thank Allah for one ni'mah. وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا The singular is used. If you try to count and truly appreciate the one ni'mah of Allah, you will not be able to encompass it. When we do ni'mah, when we thank Allah for having our eyes, when we thank Allah for having a job, when we thank Allah for having feet and having toes on our feet, when we thank Allah for a tongue that can move, 
When we thank Allah for these things, we don't even know how much it helps us. We have some idea of how it helps us. We don't even know how much it would harm us. We have some imagination of how much it would harm us. We don't really fully understand the ni'mah. We can only think based on our limited imagination. We can't even do that for one. So it's pretty awesome that Ibrahim salam was able to do it for a few. It's, it's, an, it's a testimony to the gratitude of Ibrahim salam. But the other context, Allah Azza says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Wa asbagha alaykum ni'amahu zahiratan wa batina. He unleashed his favors on you. He unleashed his blessings on you. The ones you can see and the ones you cannot see. Zahiratan wa batinatan. Is this a context of few or many? So he used ni'am. He used the powerful plural. And these are not ayat next to each other. These are years apart in Revelation, pages and pages apart in the Quran. How do you keep track? Of what should fit where perfectly. This, this is what Allah Azza wa Jal does in the Quran. This was my first example. We're moving along quickly. Man, this next one. One of my favorites, actually. Surah Al-Saf. Surah Al-Saf. Allah talks about Musa alayhi salam. Then He talks about Isa alayhi salam. Which nation was Musa alayhi salam sent to? Huh? Bani Israel. Very good. You, you guys are better than some of the kids I teach. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes you get scary answers. You know, I was used to teach at a Sunday school, hey, where was the Prophet born? This kid raised in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> we got a long way to go. <laughs> you know. But anyway, Musa alayhi salam spoke to which nation? Bani Israel. Okay. Isa alayhi salam is in the next ayah. Which nation was he sent to? Bani Israel. They were both sent to? Bani Israel. Okay. When Allah talks about Musa alayhi salam, He says, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ When Musa said to his nation. When Musa alayhi salam said to his nation. Who is his nation? Bani Israel. And the next ayah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ Isa, Isa ibn Maryam. Ya Bani Israel. And by the way, uh, uh, Musa alayhi salam said, Ya Qawmi. Ya Qawmi. Anybody know what Ya Qawmi means? My people. My people. Lima tu'udhunani. Why do you cause me pain? What kind of people are you? But you're my people. Why are you doing this? But when Isa alayhi salam spoke, he did not say Ya Qawmi. He said, Ya Bani Israel. Ya Bani Israel. Very next ayah. What's strange is, they are both prophets, they are both messengers, they are both talking to the same exact what? Patient. So how come one of them says, Ya Qawmi? And the other one in the very next ayah, Allah makes him say what? Ya? When Israel. You see, in the Arabic, in Arabic tradition, to be from a nation, your father has to be from that nation. To be from a nation, who must be from that nation? Your father. If my father is Pakistani and my mother is Bangladeshi, then according to that, I am what? I'm Pakistani, even though my mom is Pakistani too. I'm just saying. Okay? Like my kids, my wife is Indian. My wife's Indian. So, and I'm Pakistani. And there's a confusion in the household. So, I, so we decide the kids are Bangladeshi, therefore. We just, that's what we, <laughs> we settled the issue. <laughs> But anyway, technically, because I am the father, then they, they will be what? Pakistani. More than anything else, they're confused. But wh whatever. The, no, and by the way, since I brought this up about Bani Israel, I should tell you recently, I know you, some of you are like, al-Azim, la hawla wa la la billah. Recently, I made friends with a rabbi. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-Azim. Some of you are getting up right now like, Tu, I'm leaving here. Like, <laughs> So what happened was, I was giving a talk about Ibrahim alayhi salam to non-Muslims. I was talking about the place of Abraham in Islam. And I, would give, I was giving this talk and a rabbi, like a, like a proper rabbi, one of those rabbi rabbis, was sitting in the first row. And the guy was crying the entire time. The entire time. 
And he came up to me afterwards, and we started talking, we became good friends. And we, you know, we spent some time together and discussed things here and there, and we've, we've had some pretty interesting exchange with each other. We, we, I, I told him, look, I want to talk to you about Moses and Abraham. This is why I want to be your friend. I want to talk to you about Musa and Ibrahim السلام, because Allah talks to my, my master and my, our, our Lord in his revelation talks to your, your people a lot. Ya Bani Israel, Ya Bani Israel, Ya Bani Israel. So clearly you have some background. And Allah is talking to you based on your background. And I want to understand your perspective. I don't want to talk about you, I want to talk to you. I don't want to judge what you say from books, I want to judge what you say from you. You tell me what you believe about Musa. You tell me what you believe about Ibrahim salam, And they say the most ridiculous things. They do. We have the, the most incredible conversations about, uh, about the Prophets. And they are... Wallahi, I tell you one thing I learned from that. And he's, we still talk a lot. We call him Ibrahim. They call him Ibrahim. Right? And we even have a recitation, Ibrahim. But we're talking about two different people. What we know about Ibrahim salam, they have no idea. We call him Musa, they call him Mushe, Torat Mushe. But who we call Musa in the Quran, and who, who they call, Wallahi, when you read and when you hear what they say about these same people, you will say, you're not talking about my Musa alayhi salam. You're talking about somebody else. I don't know who you're talking about. That ain't him. You got the wrong address or something. Because this is... Because we disagree on almost everything. Almost everything. But you know why? When I brought this up. I was talking to you about Surah Al-Saf. One, one messenger says, Ya Qawmi. The other messenger says, what? Yeah. Ya Bani Israel. Why did I bring up the rabbi? Because the, you know, the rabbis hold the opinion that to be from a nation, your mother should be from that nation. They're, they have that opinion. That's in, Judaism, in traditional Judaism, they, it's a recent development, but they have it. So he says, no, ethnicity does not come from the father. Ethnicity comes from the mother. I said, okay, rabbi, let's have some fun then. Musa alayhi salam ran away from Egypt. He ran to a place called Madian. Madian is Arab. You know that, right, Rabbi? He goes, yes, of course, it's Arab. It's Arab. Okay, and he met a man in Madian, and that man married his daughter to Musa. So Musa married an Arab. You, okay? you with me, Rabbi? You, you good? Yeah, yeah, Musa married an Arab. Okay, therefore, all of his children, according to you, are Arabs. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just like, uh, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Ethnicity comes from who? Father. The father. That's why, Rabbi, you call your people the sons of Israel. You don't call your nation by the name of your mother, you call your nation by the name of your father. All of humanity is called children of who? Adam, not Hawa. We call ourselves Banu Adam, children of Adam. Why? Because our identity comes from who? The father. This is how it started, guys. Last name Adam. That's how it started. And it's been that way since. It's been that way since. Now, coming back to this. To be from a nation, who has to be from that nation? When Musa alayhi salam says, Ya qawmi. You know what he's saying? You're my people because my father is from you. Isa alayhi salam in the Quran never says, Ya qawmi. Never says, Ya qawmi. He always says what? Ya bani Israel. And he cannot say, Ya qawmi. Because if he says, Ya qawmi, he would be saying, My father is from you. The technical problem with that is, he doesn't have a father. So he cannot say, Ya qawmi. He can only say, Ya bani Israel. The Quran protects the virgin birth of Jesus better than the Bible. Ya Bani Israel. This is what you call precision beyond human ability. Allah didn't have to write a separate chapter on why we believe that Isa alayhi salam is not, you know, born of a, or, or doesn't have a father. He can just make him say Ya Bani Israel and that's enough. That's enough. And what did I tell you? Identity comes from who? Father. Father. So we say about the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Muhammadun ibn Abdullah. Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Right? Okay, we say for example, Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab, but we say Isa ibn, oh, Allah broke it, because this time you cannot have another identity, sorry, there's no father available, 
There's no father. So you have to say what? Maryam. There is no other man. There is no other person. When you talk about them and you say Ibn and you say a woman's name. Except who? Isa alayhi salam. Because it's a part of our belief that this is only one parent. There's no, there's no other parent. So you have to say Ibn Maryam. And this is also this is an honoring of Maryam salamun alayha. And it's a further validation of the virgin birth. You know, in some renditions of the Bible, the first chapters of the Bible are the lineage of Jesus. <laughs> and the husband of Mary and all of that. The Quran completely cleanses the, the messenger and uh, Maryam salamun alayha of this accusation. So this was the second example that I wanted to share with you. Third example. Oh, now it starts getting heavy. I was keeping it light for now. But now we get to the heavy stuff. Surah Al-Jumu'ah. يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ الْمَلِكِ الْقُدُّوسِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ Those of you who read the Qur'an regularly, all of you, know that Allah in many ayat, in the end of the ayah, Allah mentions two of His names. وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ عَزِيزٌ ذُو انتقام. You know that, right? Allah mentions two of His names many, many, many times. The ayah, I'll read it to you again. You tell me what's unique. يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ الْمَلِكِ الْقُدُّوسِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ What's unique? Four, unique, isn't it? Four names. And I want to mention the basic meanings of these four names in order for you to appreciate something about this, these ayat. Al-Malik means the king. First one, going easy translation. Al-Malik means what? The king. Al-Quddus means the, the perfectly pure. The perfectly pure. And you can also say the source of all purity. The source of all purity. So Al-Malik means what? You tell me now. The king. Al-Quddus means what? Source of all purity. Al-Aziz is the third one. Al-Aziz means the authority. Al-Aziz, the authority. Al-Hakim has lots of meanings, but I'm only sharing one of each. Al-Hakim is the wise. The wise. Let's start over. What was the first name in Arabic? Al-Malik. What does it mean? The king. Al-Quddus. What does that mean? Huh? The source of all purity. The ultimately pure. The perfectly pure. Al-Aziz means what? The authority. Al-Hakim means what? Okay. The first ayah of Surah Al-Jumu'ah is about Allah. This ayah is about Allah. The second ayah of Surah Al-Jumu'ah is about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. First ayah about Allah, second ayah about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ The second ayah, I'll translate in a second is about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam One of my favorite ayat of the Qur'an because in this ayah is a summary of the entire seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam In one ayah, the entire seerah The entire seerah Now in this one ayah Allah talks about the way that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam transformed society How was he able to do it? What steps did he follow? And Allah mentions four steps Allah mentions how many? Four steps. Hmm, where did we hear four before? How many names of Allah were mentioned? Four. And Allah, the Messenger follows how many? Four. four steps. Now let me take a step back. I'll stop and give you something to think about. Imagine you live in a time a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, three thousand years ago. You are traveling on your brand name donkey and you enter into a new kingdom. How do you know you've entered a kingdom at the border? How do you know you've entered a kingdom? What will you notice? Flags, statues, right? You'll notice soldiers that bear the mark of the king. You might notice a castle. You will see certain signs that this is a kingdom or this place has a king. You will notice the signs. You understand? A king is known by his symbols. You will not know a king unless he's wearing a crown. If a king's wearing a t-shirt, you're not going to know he's a king. He has to be wearing his robe and a crown. If a king is living in a third floor apartment, he's not a king. You got the wrong. 
<laughs> not a, he can call himself royalty all he wants. You know, he has to have a castle. These are signs, pretty good indications that you are dealing with a king. So uh, the first point I want to make is a king is known by his signs. Okay, what was the first name of Allah mentioned? Al-Malik. What does it mean? Allah says about the Prophet wasallam that he does four things, yes? The first thing is yatlu alayhim ayatihi He reads on to the people the king's signs. How is a king known? By his signs. And the messenger tells the people his signs. Notice his kingdom. You see those mountains over there? That's part of his kingdom. You see that sun over there? That's part of his kingdom. That's how you know you're dealing with a king. You see the stars at night? That's, that's the kingdom of Allah. You know? He's known by his signs. Number two. Number two. What was the second name of Allah, by the way? Qudus. In the ayah, what was it? Al Qudus. What does it mean? I forgot. Source of all? The second thing the Messenger does, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ayah says, wa yuzakkihim, and he purifies them. He reads the, the king's signs onto them, and he what? Purifies them. What was the second name of Allah? Source of all purity. You see a connection? The third thing, before I tell you about the third thing, Allah says He's the ultimate authority. You remember that? Where do laws come from? Laws come from an authority. In a house, the rules come from the parents. They cannot come from the child. Because the parents have what? Authority. In a classroom, the rules come from the teacher. They don't come from the students. Because the teacher has what? Authority. In a country, the rules come from the government. They, don't, they come from the people making the laws, the courts or whoever else. They don't come from the employee. Because who has the authority? The courts do. You understand? The laws come from the authority. Allah says, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ He teaches them the book. And the word book in Arabic, kitab, is used in Arabic literature for law. So it's like saying, He teaches them the law. And law can only be given by the proper authority. Al-Aziz is the only one who can make kitab. You cannot have kitab without izzah. You cannot have law without... And by the way, the book, even in English literature, we say, in, for example, in American English, the judge threw the book at him. You, that does not mean that the judge got angry during the case, took a phone book, <laughs> and hit the plaintiff on the head with a book. What does it mean? It means the judge used the full extent of the law against this person. He threw the book at him. That's what it means. Or when someone says, I'm going to do this by the book, what does it mean? I'm going to do this according to the law. That's what I'm going to do. That's by the book. You follow? So Al Aziz is the authority, and the messenger teaches people the law from the authority. What was the last name of Allah that was mentioned in this sequence? Al Malik, Al Quddus, Al Aziz, Al Hakim, the wise. Allah says, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He teaches them wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? It comes from the wise. Four names of Allah in one ayah. Four activities of the messenger in the second ayah. And they're each correlated perfectly. And it's not like... It took me 20 minutes to explain this to you. But Allah just says it. He just says it. What human being is able to think, I just said four names of Allah, I should correlate each of them with a verb and an act and a, you know, a principle that corresponds perfectly in sequence to what I just said. Beyond human capability. We're not able to do that. And Allah just, and we just read right through it. We read right through these miracles, right through these powerful observations, and we, most of the time we don't even realize what we just read. Most of the time we don't even taste what was just said. And wallahi, if you do, you're just left there like Allahu Akbar. Like you're just you're left overwhelmed. This was was my was that my second or my third example? That was my third example. Okay. Oh. There's two left. There's two left. That's all I got. I don't have much work for you today. It's so easy. So I want to talk to you about the end of Surah Al Jumu'ah also. The end of Surah, the end of Surah Al-Jumu'ah. But before I do, 
Actually, no, maybe I wouldn't give you a, a, a prerequisite. I'll just tell you the story itself. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was giving a khutbah. Jumu'ah. Khutbah al Jumu'ah. Sahaba are sitting and listening. Now, we know the, the manners of khutbah al Jumu'ah nowadays. Make sure your cell phone is on. Make sure it's full volume. Make sure you have a 50 cent ringtone. Right? Make sure to have, I don't know who calls you right during Salat, but make sure you find some friend who will call you right at that time. Okay? So we, we have certain adab of the khutbah nowadays that we have to follow. Alhamdulillah. Okay? So, uh, and we're pretty good at that, mashallah. And of course, there are the people who have so much taqwa that when they're standing in Salat and praying and their phone goes off and it's an Indian song or whatever, they have so much taqwa that they cannot reach their hand in their pocket and turn it off. We have to listen to the entire thing. <laughs> you know? It's especially entertaining during Dhuhr and Asr. Silent prayers, we get to enjoy it with full khushu'ah. <laughs> right? It's awesome. It's the best. You know? So, we know the manners of the khutbah. Or at least we're supposed to. We're supposed to know. And make sure you, you're the last one to get there. <laughs> make sure. Make sure you get there in a time. Maybe catch like the second ruku. <laughs> so you can fulfill the accounting principle L-I LIFO, you know, last in, first out. <laughs> you know. Also make, you sh make sure you park your car in a way that nobody else can get out. <laughs> just this. These are from the manners of the khutbah that you must follow. And all of you are mashallah familiar. We're, we're, we're good Muslims, so we know these things. Okay. So anyway, the, the, the manners of khutbah were not yet revealed. It was not yet revealed that you have to stay there, you have to sit there, the khutbah is part of the salat. All of these things were not yet revealed. But the sahaba were still sitting there and attending the khutbah. Now, uh, this is interesting because, you know, right now we are at this, this, this forum and this building and there's a convention going on. And you know, there are different kinds of conventions nowadays, like there's a computer convention, there's a car, you know, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Expositions, car expo, computer expo, technology expo. I come from Texas, we have gun expos, <laughs> right? So <laughs> we really do, by the way, we have gun expos. It's pretty cool, you see a giant sign, gun expo, next exit. You speed your car up, <laughs> I want to go to the gun expo. But anyway, when usually a, one of these expositions comes by, and one of these expos happen, then a lot of people go there for business, right? They're going to go set up their trade booth, they're going to make other business contacts, they're going to make some deals, that's why they go. But a lot of people go for what? Just to hang out. Hey, there's a car expo, let's go. I, w I always wanted to sit in a Ferrari. Take a picture, take a picture. <laughs> right? Some people don't go for business, they go for what? The pictures, the hangout, you know, that's why they go. Now in Medina, in Medina sometimes there would be expos, trade expos, they would come by, back in the day. And the Prophet ﷺ is giving his khutbah, the sahaba are sitting, and a trade expo is leaving. Now the people who are in business, it's very important to them to catch the trade expo because if they miss it, it will not come back until two years from now, three years from now, and they will miss a lot of business. And in the khutbah, there are some business people sitting there. So they decide, I still have some time, Salat hasn't started yet. I should go make some deals quickly, because it's leaving. And I'll come right back. So they left the khutbah. They left the khutbah. Now, when they left, they left for business or pleasure? Business. business. But you know when people leave for business, and there's a, the expos are usually nice and colorful, and there's like an elephant or whatever. Back in the day, I'm saying. Nowadays, there's beautiful colors, flyers, lights, you know? And, and a lot of people around there. So it looks interesting, and even if you're not from that business, let me see what's going on over there. Hey, hey let's go check it out. So when you see a couple of business people get up and leave, and you're one of the useless people on the face of the earth, you're a college student. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Then you say to yourself, I got no business, but I mean, that looks pretty cool. Let's go check it out. We'll be right back. 
So some people go, people first get up and go for business, and some people go for entertainment. They go for entertainment. Now listen to the ayah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً أَوْ لَهْوًا إِنْ فَضُّوا إِلَيْهَا وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمًا When they saw business or entertainment, they ran towards it. They broke the group and went towards it. And they left you standing there. وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمًا What was mentioned first? Business or entertainment? Business was mentioned first because the people who first got up did not get up for entertainment. They got up for what? Business. And they're thinking, I'm going to miss the opportunity. I want people to make the sale. So they got up and left. Okay. Now listen. قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Same ayah. قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ مِّنَ اللَّهْوِ وَمِنَ التِّجَارَةِ عَلَى العكس. He reversed the sequence. He said what Allah has is better than entertainment and business. وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الرَّازِقِينَ And Allah is the best provider. Allah changed the sequence in the same ayah. When he started in the beginning, he said they saw business or entertainment. Later on, he said what Allah has is better than entertainment and better than business. So the question arrives, how come Allah changes sequence in the Qur'an? How come He reverses things like that? I told you the explanation for why business was mentioned first in the beginning. What was it? Because the first people to get up, got up for business. And second people got, oh, it might, looks like fun, let's go. But then Allah is not talking about that expo. The next part of the ayah is the principle for Muslim life. The part about the expo is done. Now Allah is going to teach us a lesson about life altogether, based on that experience. Now, based on that experience, you tell me now, in all honesty, is everybody into business? But is everybody into entertainment? <laughs> Not everybody is into business, but man, everybody in one way or another gets distracted by entertainment. So which is the more universal culprit? Oh, so when Allah talks about the culprits that will take you away from the remembrance of Allah, what did He mention first? This time, entertainment. He says, "Qul ma Allahi khairu min al-lahwi wa min al-tijara." Secondarily, from business also, "Wallahu khairul raziqin," and Allah is the best of all providers. Since I'm on the subject, I want to share a couple of other things about these beautiful ayat with you. You understand the sequence difference, right? Just a couple of other quick things. You know, I have a, 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 this thing about entertainment distracting. I used to have a job of chaplaincy. I used to be at a university and my part of my job was to make sure, just to help the Muslim students on campus and to maybe sometimes lead the, lead the khutbah, lead the Jumu'ah prayer. And there were like six or seven Muslim students in the entire campus. And I would go and sometimes go for Jumu'ah at the chapel and I'm, it's Salat time and nobody's there. Nobody's there. And I have to call these students in their dorm rooms. Uh, Kareem, uh, I'm, I'm at the chapel, it's Jumu'ah. Oh yeah? Uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm really busy right now. I'm like, what are you doing? Uh, Halo? <laughs> Bro, it's Jumu'ah. I know, I know, I know. I'll like, like before Asr, I'll be there. I told you college students, the most useful people on the planet. But anyway, so, <laughs> you know, so you have, you, people are taken away from the remembrance of Allah because of what? Entertainment. There are people, maybe in this audience, I mean, they're here by accident or their mother made them come, you know. But like, you know, you're sitting at home, you got your PS3, you got your Xbox 360, I don't know, you got your, I don't know what else you got, some other fitna device, and then you're sitting there, and you got yourself like Grand Theft Auto, or you got yourself like an Assassin's Creed, or you got yourself like, you know, Modern Warfare or something. And you close the doors and pull the curtains and you're like... <laughs> and, and then the sun comes up and the sun goes down, empires rise and fall, governments change. You're just in there, hum, hum, you know, you don't know what's going on, you know. There are people like that, they're distracted from life because of their, you know, I have to rank number five, I have to get to number five. <laughs> that, that'll mean something. Finally, your life will be worth something, okay? You know, 
if your screen name moves up a little on the rank, online rankings. But any, in any case, I want to talk to you about business. Really interesting. I had a student last year in my, in my program who was a very successful businessman. And he's been in business for maybe 15, 20 years. And subhanAllah, he has one of his biggest customers is a, uh, uh, a Jewish man from New York. And he calls him for 20 years, a loyal customer. He gives him the biggest orders. Every single Friday, right at khutbah starts at 1.15. 1.14, every single Friday, he calls him and gives him a big order. Every single Friday. And he has to say to him, uh, I can't talk. Oh, why? Oh, it's Friday, it's prayer time. Oh, I didn't realize. Next week, same thing. Next week, same thing for 20 years. <laughs> for 20 years. The thing I wanted to highlight to you, the word Allah used in this surah for business, did you hear it? Yeah. What was the word? Anybody hear it? Tijara. Tijara. But you know what? Allah did not always use this word in the surah for business. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, ida nudiya lissalati min yom al Jumuati, fasgau ila dikr Allah, wadharu tijara, no, wadharu bayi." He did not use the word tijara for business. He used the word bayi before. Bayi, bayi actually does not mean business. Bayi means sale. Bayi means sale. How many people in business over here? How many people in business? Like two people in business? Astaghfirullah al what, what you doing? What you people do over here? Okay, anyway. Get into a business, sell bananas, do something. Do a business. Anyway, but... So listen. When you're in a business, there are lots, there's lots of works. There's accounting. There is payroll. Oh, payroll hurts when you have to write the check. There's accounts payable. There's the electricity bills. There's the maintenance. There's security. There's scheduling, there's human resource management, there's hiring, and there's firing, and there's all these different things. You gotta keep track of everything when you're running a business, right? There's the stock, how much you gotta buy, how much is left, what was sold, what were the refunds, what came back, what are the goods, etc., etc. There's so many things to worry about in business, so many things. And one of the most painful things, of course, if you're like a business owner and you pay your employees on Thursday or Friday, like in, you know, in America, we don't have Friday off. So you're, if you're supposed to pay your employees on Friday, then if you're a Muslim, you probably go to Jum'ah early. You're supposed to write the check at the time, like, ah, maybe I should go remember Allah, because it hurts too much to sign those checks. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but you know what? If you're about to close your shop at Jum'ah, you're about to close your shop, and a customer walks in. And the customer didn't, you know, some customers carry the little basket, but some customers have the big shopping cart. And the customer's putting in things in the cart and he's piling them in and piling them in and his khutbah starts at 1.15 and it's 1.10 and they're like, okay, 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 he can, he can do it, he can do it, it's okay, it's okay. And he piles it in and he piles it in and he piles it in. And you're like, um, you know, if, you, if this was the time to write the checks or to fill out the tax form or to pay the electricity bill, you would shut it down and you would go to Salat. But if a juicy customer walks in, and he's filling the cart. Is that easy to leave or hard to leave? Uh, so business is not always, it's, business may be easy to leave. You know what's hard to leave? Sale. sale. Because the sale is what makes everything else worth it. All the pain you go through in business is for one thing and one thing only, which is what? Sale. The sale. So when the sale comes, you're like, uh, just a little bit late. I'll catch this a lot. I'll catch the second rakah. Let me just finish this sales, a very important sales call. Let me finish this first. Allah says, leave the sales call. <laughs> but how am I going to make my money? Wallahu khayrul raziqeen. Allah will provide. That's not you. Allah tested you with that sales call. Allah tested you with that you know, juicy customer. And you say, I'm sorry, sir. It's time for prayer. I have to go. We have to shut down. Can I, you sure I can't just buy? I have cash. Look at this cash. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, sir. We have to close the shop. It's prayer time. I, I, I apologize. We have to leave. And Allah will send you those. You know, He sent those to Bani Israel, that rizq. At the time that they were supposed to be doing ibadah, the fish would jump out of the water. They would jump high, wink at them, and then go back in the water. 
<laughs> what you got? What you got? Looks juicy, huh? huh? You know? They would do that. This is how Allah tests. Wallahu khairul raziqeen. So this was my next example. Now, inshallah ta'ala, oh, I made my way to my favorite example. You don't have to raise your hand, but if you can't, if you, if you raise it, I, I'll feel good about myself. How many people know Ayatul Kursi? Ayatul Kursi. The last example of the evening I want to share with you is Ayatul Kursi. Okay, we're going to recite it together. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Man dha alladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi-idhnih. Ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum. ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض وهو العلي العظيم. آية الكرسي is made up of nine sentences. آية الكرسي has nine sentences. I'll walk you through them. الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم. Number one. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. Number two. لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Number three. What's number four? مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ That's number four. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Number five. Then, وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءَ Number six. Then, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْض Number seven, ولا يؤده حفظهما. Number eight, وهو العلي العظيم. Number nine, nine sentences. The first sentence is Allah لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم. It's a beautiful sentence which ends with two of Allah's names. What are those two names? الحي القيوم, the living and the source of all establishment. Everything stands and exists and is maintained because of Allah. What's incredible is that the last sentence, sentence number one, has something in common with sentence number nine, which is وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ How many names of Allah in the, in the last sentence? Two names of Allah in the first sentence, two names of Allah in the last sentence. Okay. What's the second sentence? Before I go to the second sentence, let me tell you something about security. Security guards have a very hard job. They have, you see those British guys that wear the funny hats at the towers? That can't smirk? That's a hard job. And one of the best jobs for college students. <laughs> but if you get a secure, you know, if you're in security, you have to stand, sit in your booth, you have to stare at the CCTV for hours and hours. And does it move? It's the same picture. And you have to look at it for 12 hours, 8 hours. It's the most exciting thing you've ever done in your life. What tends to happen when you're guarding something? You tend to get sleepy. You tend to get tired. When you're guarding something, you tend to, you, you, so you'll see, of course you don't watch movies because you're very religious, but, you know. But in movies, they have these things called movies, and then sometimes they have, a, they have an action movie, and the, the guy is trying to get inside a place, but it has a security guard, but the security guard is... So he grabs him, click, you know, and he gets inside because the guy's getting the security guard's getting sleepy. You understand? Okay. Allah Azza wa Jal says about Himself, "La ta'khuduhu sinatun, wala nawm." Drowsiness. Drowsiness happens when you're tired. Your eyes start getting kind of closing a little bit. You're not sleeping, but you're kind of half sleeping, like that, that guy over there. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Which are half sleeping. That's, that's sina. And of course, what happens after that? What's the next step? No. First comes sina. Sina is like, you know, when, when you go to Jumu'ah and the khatib says, Inna alhamdulillah, alladhi nahmaduhu nasta'inah. Like that's sina. Okay? By the time he gets to, ayyuha al-ikhwatul kiram. That's, that's no. Okay? <laughs> That's no. Okay, so you know the difference between sinna and no. Drowsiness and then sleep. Okay. This is the second sentence. 
The second sentence is, these are things that creation has. Creation gets tired and it starts getting drowsy and eventually it falls to sleep. You know? Or sometimes you tell yourself, no, 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 I'm just closing my eyes but I'm not sleeping. <laughs> okay, let me just close my eyes for a second. <laughs> You're gone. You're finished. Okay? Now here's the thing. I know something about Sina and Noam because I'm a teacher by profession. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> being a teacher is all, you might as well do a, you know, a PhD in sleep sciences or sleep, sleep studies because you see students like, you know how you, people check out of a hotel? You can see their brains checking out. Like, <laughs> in the middle of a lecture, like... <laughs> it's the best. This is the second sentence, about sleep, about exhaustion and sleep. Drowsiness and sleep. What was the second last sentence? وَلَا يَأُودُهُ حِفْضُهُمَا Guarding the skies and the earth does not exhaust Allah. When someone's exhausted, what do they get? Sina and... No, the second sentence is actually connected to the second last sentence. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم ولا يأوده حفظهما. He says لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ. He owns whatever is in the sky and the earth. Now, before I tell you further, you need to understand the difference between two words, two names of Allah: Malik and Malik. Two names of Allah: Malik and Malik, I hope I can explain this difference to you because it will make you appreciate these ayat like nothing else. Malik is an owner. Malik is an owner. Malik, I already told you today, what is Malik? King. king. Is there a difference between a king and an owner? Yes. You are the owner of your pen. But you do not say, I am the royal sovereign of this ink pen. <laughs> you don't do that. That doesn't make a lot of sense. You understand? Owners can be of small things. You can own a car, you can own a computer, you can own a phone. But you don't, you're not going to be the king of it. Kingdom is used for big things. Here's another problem. Ownership, ownership is about property. It's about property. But kingdom is not about, you know, you're not a, the king over a tree or the king over a piece of land. You're the king over the people who live in that land. Kingdom is about controlling people. Ownership is about controlling objects. There's a difference. Now Allah says, لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ He owns whatever is in the skies and the earth. What is the ayah about? Ownership. The ayah is about? Ownership. And ownership, one thing about ownership, it's micro. So every single thing is owned by Allah. Okay. What's the third last sentence? Anyone remember? Wasi'a kursiyuhu samawati wal ard. His throne extends to the skies and the earth. When Allah talks about His throne, He's talking about His kingdom. One dimension of control is ownership, the other dimension is kingdom. Both completing the picture. Because if you're just an owner, you're not a king. And if you're just a king, you're not an owner. Oh, by the way, let me tell you the difference also. Nowadays in some countries we have kings. You can be the king of an island. But does that mean you own everything in that island? No. Allah is the owner of all things and the king of all things. This is, both of them are necessary. Just because you own, and by the way, it could be that somebody owns all the property, but they're not the king. Is that possible? Yeah. They own the property, but the, the king is someone else. So they have property ownership, but somebody else has authority. Or somebody has authority and no property ownership. But Allah has, Allah is Malik, and He is Malik. The Malik part of Allah's attribute, لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Third sentence. The king, kingdom of Allah, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Okay. What's the fourth sentence? Let's go back. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. Lahu ma fi al-samawati wa ma fi al-ard. What's next? Man dhal ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi idhnihi. Let's understand this ayah first. Who will come and make shafa'a with Allah except unless he gives permission? In other words, what is shafa'a? Shafa'a, if you don't understand the concept, because we use big English words like intercession. But let's make it simple. 
Shafa'a means you got connections. Shafa'a means that you were about to lose your job, but your uncle is the manager and he came and said, no, 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 he's, he's, he's with me. <laughs> okay, balo. He's good. That's Shafa'a. On judgment day, we are in trouble possibly, and then somebody comes and says, no, 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 they're, they're, they're with me. They're with me. Go easy on them, please. We beg Allah Azza wa Jal to qualify us for the shafa'a of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah says, nobody will come for you. Your uncle, your cousin, your dad, your mom, your boss. You're not going to come for you on judgment day. <laughs> ya Allah, actually he's... he's. <laughs> not going to happen on that day. We're good. You know, nowadays you can do that. They're with me, VIP pass, so you can go inside. No, 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 not over there. There's no VIP ticket. Except, the only exception is if Allah gives permission. So this ayah is about nobody having any authority unless Allah gives it to them. Nobody will have any authority and the only exception, and the word exception is important, the exception is if Allah gives it to them. You clear about that? Okay. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِهِ They know nothing, they can control, they, have in, they encircle nothing of his knowledge. إِلَّا except بِمَا شَاءٍ The fourth sentence and the sixth sentence are both about a statement about Allah and the only exception. The statement was, nobody has authority to make a case except Whoever Allah gives permission. They have no knowledge except, except whoever He wants to give knowledge to. Otherwise, they know nothing. The two, fourth and the sixth sentence are correlated. The first and the ninth, the second and the eighth, the third and the seventh, the fourth and the sixth. What's left? Middle sentence? He says, وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Oh my God, he says he knows what is ahead of them and what is behind them. As though, and he knew what is coming ahead in the ayah and what was yeah. behind in the ayah. He put the, in, the, in the middle of it is, I know what's ahead and I know what's behind. Who speaks like that? Who speaks like that? SubhanAllah. The way in which Allah talks, the way in which Allah delivered this speech, and I want you to be cognizant of a fact. The fact is, we now read the Qur'an as a book. We read it as a text. We say sentence number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Did the Sahaba do that? Did the Rasul himself says, look at sentence number 1 and sentence number 9 and 2 and 8 and 3 and 7? No, because he was just what? Speaking. He was speaking the Qur'an. We are able to see these things when they're put in writing. The Qur'an was so perfect when he was, it was being given in speech. And which has more possibility of mistake? When you write something or when you say something? Oh man, when you say something, it's hard to take it back. Especially if it's on YouTube. <laughs> That's hard. But if you're writing a nasty email, then you can, before you hit send, say, erase that and just say Eid Mubarak and then send it. <laughs> like, yeah. You have a chance to take it back. But when, you are, when you're saying something, it's done. There's no room to edit. There's no room to fix. Allah Azza wa Jal revealed this Qur'an not in writing. He revealed it in speech. He revealed it in speech. You know, I've sat with linguists, non-Muslim linguists, and I've shared some of these things with them. And they refuse to believe that the Qur'an is spoken. They refuse to believe it. They say it has to be written. It can't be spoken. I was like, you're right, it is written, just not in this world. It is written. You know, it's filawah al mahfuz. It is written, but it was given to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as speech, so it would become very clear to anybody who listens. This cannot be from a human being. The last bit that I want to share with you tonight, Inshallah Taala, is something that is it requires some very serious thinking, and I want you guys, Inshallah Taala, to pay, pay as best attention as you can. There, there's one last concept I want to share with you, and maybe I'm in a good mood, so I'll share one more example with you too. One of my favorite examples. But the concept I want to share with you. You know, if I was to pick up an article about taqwa, 
or if I pick up an article about Iman, or I pick up an article about Hadith, some subject in Islam, and I start, I grab the mic and I start reading the article. Sometimes in the Muslim world, for example, the khutbah is written, and the Imam goes up and he reads the khutbah. Even if you can't see the Imam, because you're one of those awesome Muslims who is last to the Jumu'ah prayer and you're sitting by the shoes outside, <laughs> right? If you're one of those awesome Muslims and you don't see the Imam, can you tell that he's reading and not speaking? You can actually tell from his tone. You can tell from almost like, the, it's not natural language. Because written language is very formal, right? You don't, you have longer sentences. As I'm speaking to you right now, when I'm speaking to you right now, I have made countless grammatical mistakes. I have repeated myself several times. I have repeated myself several times. I have repeated myself several times. If I was writing an article, would I repeat myself in this way? No, and actually if somebody transcribed my lecture, they would hopefully remove all of the repetition. You understand? And I say things like, uh-huh, you understand? Did you get that? Hmm? Huh? Uh-huh. But I don't write those things, do I? You don't see like H-E-H-E. -E. Like, <laughs> like you, <laughs> you don't get that in, a, in writing. What I'm trying to say is when you're speaking, when you're speaking and when you're reading, people who know you can tell the difference especially. If your child, for example, memorized a piece of poetry, and you've never heard this poetry before, but they memorized it, and they came to you and they started reciting this poetry, will you know that this is not something from your child? You will know. Like, where'd you get that from? No, 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 I just said it, I made it up. I swear, no, no, you didn't make it up. Tell me where you got it from. You know? You can tell this is not his speech. There's a clear distinction between spoken word and written word. Written word is far more accurate, far too accurate to be natural. It doesn't occur naturally for people. They hesitate and stumble and make mistakes, etc., etc. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was among his people for 40 years. They argue in linguistics that people have speech patterns. People tend to use similar kinds of sentences. People tend to make the same kinds of mistakes when they speak. You know? They have add-ons, like I say, you know, a lot. That's my thing. I say, you know? You know? I say that a lot, like, you know? <laughs> so they, there's a pattern in speech. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam started reciting Qur'an, was it like his other speech? No. And can you immediately tell, wait, 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 that's not how he talks. Nobody talks like that. I never heard anybody talk like that. What is that? You understand? They don't see a book in front of him. They don't see the angel giving him the book. They don't see any of it. But they can still tell this is not from him. This is from somewhere else. This is not from him. So when they heard it, they would call him a magician. Right? They would call him a magician. Now the thing with magic is magic is something you're supposed to see. If I pull a pigeon out of here right now, you know, if I pulled out a napkin from here and it kept on going, you know, then this would be something you see and you're impressed. Magic is usually and pretty much always something you see. The Quraysh are calling Rasul Sallallahu a magician not because of something they see, but because of something they... Oh, that's weird. That's weird. They are so impressed by this speech, even though they don't believe, that they are ready to call it as impressive as magic. So we think when they called him a magician, they were insulting him. But actually, they themselves didn't even realize they were accepting half the faith already. Because when you call something magic, you've already taken a leap of faith. You're saying, I have no other explanation. It's some mystical, unusual, paranormal activity that's going on here that I cannot describe through science or common sense. So I'm going to call it what? Magic. Well, you're already halfway there, buddy. You already said it's from the unseen. You know, 
you're already making that progress. So this is one of the concepts I want you to think about inshallah ta'ala in your studies of the Quran. Like I said, when I come back, hopefully, hopefully, I haven't got, run this through the government yet. By that I mean my wife. <laughs> um, so if I get approval from the ministry, then inshallah ta'ala next year, you know, we'll get, a, we'll get a domestic visa. We call it domestic visa back home from, our, from the family. <laughs> so if I come, I want to share with you the entire seminar and the entire seminar is things like how come Allah repeats himself how come the surahs are in this order how come the stories are a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit there how come the names of the prophets actually what are the names of the prophets mean like what does Musa mean what does Ibrahim mean these are not Arabic words right they're not Arabic words and how is there a miracle even in the meanings of their names is there even a miracle in that subhanallah you know uh, uh, there are other questions like some people think there are mistakes in the Quran or contradictions in the Quran. Let's, let's hear what they have to say. Let's not get angry at them. Let's say, Allah says, Hatu burhanakum. Bring your evidences, bring your concerns, bring your criticisms. Allah invited them to do that. So when they do that, they say, these kuffar, they think they're contradictions in the Quran. <laughs> Dude, they're like, they're doing what Allah told them. Welcome, bring it. Bring it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it from you. Let's hear what you have to say about this book. And then let's respond. Let's do that. And we have to be people that are not afraid of criticism. Our book is so awesome, we don't have to fear criticism. We have to, we have to, be, we have to be loving this book. And we have to be so confident in this book. I tell you, I, I'm motivated to teach this particular course and these, this subject matter because I, it did something for me. There's, you know, you already have Iman, but it's spiritual in nature. But when you, get, when you go through this stuff, it becomes intellectual on top of that. There's no way this can be done by a human being. It's just... It's not possible. That's not possible. You know? Now the last example I want to share with you is not really about a miracle of the Qur'an, but a, a beauty. A beauty in the Qur'an. One time I was in an elevator uh, with a true Texan. And you know, the elevator with a true Texan, and he turned to me and he, he clearly realized that I'm Muslim. And so he says to me, you're, you're Muslim, right? And I was like, yeah. He goes, what do you Muslims get in paradise anyway? <laughs> I mean, this is an elevator pitch. My floor is coming up. So I can't have a long discussion about Jannah with him right now. So I got to give him one thing and let him think. So I said, drinks. <laughs> and I left. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, nabbit, what does that mean? So anyway, so... Now what did I mean by that? When I said to him, drinks. I want to share with you something about Surah Al-Insan. Surah Al-Insan. Also called Surah Al-Dahr. If, if you really want to appreciate what I'm going to share with you, I have to set a scene for you first. Now, some of you, hopefully, are social people. So you invite people to your homes. Okay, some of you are like, no. <laughs> but yeah, some of you invite people to your homes. Now what we do sometimes when we invite a lot of people for Eid or we invite a lot of people like at some special occasion, you don't have enough plates and enough spoons and enough you know, glasses in your house. And the dinner table is not enough for everybody. So you go in the backyard or you get a little bit of extra space and you get maybe rent out a table and you go to the store and you get like plastic tables, pl pl plastic spoons, plastic cups. You see you know what I'm talking about? And you, you can't possibly serve everyone because there's too many people at the house. So you buy the big giant you know, bottles of drink and you put them on the table and people can pour it themselves. Self-service party. This is usual you know, for people that aren't super wealthy. That's how they throw a party. That's how it is. It's normal. You understand? But then sometimes you get invited to a walima at some rich family's walima. Like the, they're like, the, you know, they got like a Toyota. They don't, their proton's not enough for them. They don't want a Toyota, you know what I'm saying? So, so you get invited to the banquet hall. And when you go to the banquet hall, there are no plastic cups. There are no plastic cups. There are glasses. And the glasses are upside down on the table before you even get there. Right? And when you sit there, a guy who's dressed like a penguin comes to you and says, More drink, more, more drink, sir. And he pours it for you. And you drink it, and he comes back and he fills it up again, and you're like, 
And you drink it again and he fills it up again and you feel guilty. <laughs> and you, and you, you, know, you have a stomach problem because he keeps filling the drink. But the idea is now you don't have to get up and get your drink when you're in a nice banquet hall, elite setting, you know, rich environment. Then you have servants that are serving the drinks. The cups are already there. You don't have to go and find your drink, etc. You can see, they'll say, what would you like to drink, sir? You understand? Now that doesn't happen in our homes, usually. That happens in an elite setting. Why am I telling you this? Because the Qur'an, when it talk, talks about Jannah, especially in Suratul Insan, when Allah talks about Jannah, He talked about drinks. And He talked about drinks three times in the same surah. The first time He talked about drinks, He said, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ يَشْرَبُونَ مِنْ كَأْسٍ The righteous people, good people, Allahumma ja'alna minhum, they will be drinking from cups. The language suggests that they will get up and get their drinks. The drinks are available. You're at the Jannah waterfall. There's a table with all the light lineup of drinks. Hold on, I'll be right back. And you go over there and you pick your drink. And the other one, the other one. But you're self-service. This is the first level. In the labrara yashrabuna min kasin. Okay. What's a more elite party that I talk to you about? Do you get the drink yourself or you are given the drink? You serve the drink. A few ayat later, وَيُسْقَوْنَ فِيهَا كَأْسًا They are given to drink in cups. Now they're not drinking out of cups themselves, they are being served the drink. وَيَطُوفُ عَلَيْهِمْ وِلْدَانٌ مُخَلَّدُونَ Young servants are running around, Sir, can I pour some more? Can I give you some more? And they're running around and serving you drinks. Fine. So this is the more elite setting. I love the fact that some orientalist intellectuals say, well the Quran, it spoke about people that were living in a desert, you see. And therefore, they spoke of drinks in paradise. It's so primitive, you see. And I was like, you're primitive, dude. <laughs> to this day, to this day, 2013, you go to an elite party and what are you going to find? Glasses, served, serving drinks. Allah Azza wa Jal put something in the Qur'an that is innate in human nature no matter how advanced we get technologically. It's still there. It's still there. The idea of people serving you feels like, oh, this is first class. What, why do you pay extra for a first class airfare? Because they come to you. Sir, would you like this? Would you like that? Would you like that? When you're in the economy class seat, they walk by and they kick your chair and they go by like, oh, you know, you know, like, there's a difference. You want to feel special. But you know what? Now in Jannah, Allah described you getting your own drink and now you are being served drink. So this is an upgrade. Yes? Is there any more upgrade available? A few ayat later, he says, وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابًا طَهُورًا Their master, Allah Himself, will give them something to drink. A purified drink. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. You see how he upgraded? First you were getting the drink yourself. Then you're being served the drink, and then Allah Himself gives you something to drink. Subhanallah. So when I turned to my Texan friend and I said, drinks, I mean it. I mean it. This is something, this is something so beautiful. Can you and I imagine even? Can you imagine the honor of being served a drink by Allah Azza wa Jal? وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابًا طَهُورًا That enough is a reason. I don't have to know about anything else in Jannah. I'm just going, شَرَابًا طَهُورًا is good enough for me. I'm set. I'm happy with that. Subhanallah. This is how the Quran builds arguments. The Ummah is in a need today. The Ummah is in need of appreciating the beauty of the Quran once again. Rediscovering what this book is. That is necessary. We have focused for too long on technical knowledge. Technicalities. Only so, so many Muslims, the only time they think about Quran is, is halal or haram. That's it. The ayat of halal and haram are so few and they're even they are beautiful. But what about the rest of this incredible book? Oh no, I already know what it says. Really? Because the most intelligent man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taught this book over 23 years. You already know what it says? And you haven't even read it once? How, how does that work? How do we, we, over, we underestimate this book so easily? So easily. And I, I pray that all of us as an ummah, wherever we are in the world, we're able to grow in our love and appreciation and admiration of this incredible book. Wallahi, every time I read, every time I read, I find something that just, I have to stop and say, whoa, Ya Rabb, 
That was awesome. That is amazing. You know, every time. I literally I have to stop. Sometimes I'm trying to memorize Quran, then I have to stop and take notes. Because that's it's too awesome. I can't think anymore. I can't memorize anymore. There's something too incredible that just passed, I just passed by. And my, my wish, my hope is whatever little studies I'm able to do, I'm able to share with you as best I can, inshaAllah ta'ala. And my hope is that you'll support the cause that I'm trying to promote. If you're benefiting from Bayina TV, I make dua that you continue to benefit and continue to grow in your relationship with the Quran. And you can do us a huge favor by spreading the word about it, telling people about it. Because I'm, I'm of the vision that in the next five to ten years, I, I, I like to think in terms of like milestones. If Allah wills, I would like to be able to offer, you know, standardized Quranic education to schools, universities, you know, and I don't want to be a school, I want to help schools. I, I, I want to help individuals. I don't want to, I don't want to come and teach you, I, I may not be able to teach you privately myself. But I want to be able to give you the tools so you can do it from home and you can help your children get something. You know, this is the time to do that for us. So this was the brief message that I had to share with all of you inshallah ta'ala. I hope you benefited from this discussion and I thank you so so very much. This is the last speech I'm giving in Malaysia and I'm, I'm really, I, I, wallahi, I'm myself and my team, we are absolutely floored and honored to be here. And I'm so happy for the things that are, the good things that are happening here in this country. I know every country has problems and you have problems too, there's no doubt about it. But the opportunities that are here, the opportunities that are here, I am telling you, they are unique. They are unique to the Ummah. Well, you, and therefore the obligation you have to do something special in this country, in this city especially. Because you know, when you do something in this city, it'll spread to the rest of the country. That's how the city is, I could tell. This is the cultural capital of this country. So when, and, and the Muslims are in significant number here, concerned Muslims, Muslims that are curious and enthusiastic about learning their religion, don't take your deen for granted. Don't take it for granted. Re-educate yourself, re-initiate a discussion about the Qur'an, reorient yourself. You know, maybe sometimes you have a bad opinion about what Allah says. Or you have a, you know, you heard something so long ago and it just made you feel bad. You know, it's so sad that so many people are spreading a message about, about Allah's book that's full of hate. That's full of like hopelessness. And you're going to Jahannam. Like, where did you get that from? We can't do that. We have to spread a message of hope. The Quran is full of hope. And I'm not making that up. You study Quran seriously, you will be filled with hope. You will not be filled with depression. You'll be filled with hope, you'll be optimistic. You know? None of you, for example, should think that you're, you asked Allah for forgiveness and I don't know if I'm forgiven or not. I mean, I, asked, I made istighfar, but I'm not sure. Quran gives us guaranteed answers. How do you know for sure you're forgiven? If you asked Allah sincerely, there's no doubt that you're forgiven. It's done, it's a matter of fact. It's, you know how there are laws of gravity and there are laws of physics? There are laws of, you know, chemistry, there are laws, just like there are laws of istighfar. There are laws of tawbah. There are laws of success in this world. There's laws of success in the next world. They don't change. There are set principles. And the set principle is, if you have sincerely turned to Allah, it's done. You're forgiven. This is guaranteed. There's no doubt about it. You don't, you should not have to say, I wonder if that was good enough. I wonder if it was, if you were sincere, it was. Worry about what you're going to do in the future now. Don't, don't get stuck in the past. Many of you have wasted time. You haven't spent enough time. Maybe you got busy with other worldly things. You didn't give this book the time it deserved. So what? That was yesterday. Allah gave you enough to be, be able to breathe today and do something about tomorrow. So change now. Make the intention now. Don't be like, oh, I've failed so many years. Nothing's going to change. No. Then you're saying you know the future. And we know only Allah knows the future. The only thing you know is the past. That's the only thing you know. Allah will change you like you would never have imagined. Never have imagined. I know that about myself, so I know that about you. Allah Azza wa Jal can change people when they make the intention. That's all, all, all it is is a matter of you deciding that. You guys are the hope of so many people that are losing touch with their deen in this country. There are people that are just Muslim by name now. There are people that don't pray anymore. And even if they pray, it's artificial. They're only holding on to deen because, you know, if they leave it or if they don't act on it, then people will look bad at, you know, badly towards them. This is not sincere deen anymore. 
We have to bring the sincerity back. We have to give people a reason to love Islam, even Muslims. We have to give them a reason to do that. And when you guys, when you people sitting in this hall, when you people become inspired by Qur'an, you will be able to inspire others. You'll be able to share that, that wealth with others and say, hey, look, look at this, listen to this. I want to tell you about this. Look at how awesome that is. Look at how beautiful Ayatul Kursi is. Isn't that cool? Oh, I never knew that. That's pretty awesome. How do you do that? Like, how did Allah do that? Well, He's, he's kind of Allah. So he, could, he, he, could, he, could, he could do that. Because I can't do that. Yeah, I know. I know. And that's just one ayah. And He said, bring a whole surah like this. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> you know? So I, 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 as, as we're leaving this country, inshallah ta'ala, Myself, my team, we're going to be making lots and lots of du'a for you. And I'm, I'm absolutely certain if Allah gives the, the, the permission, my intention is to try and come back. ta'ala. And I, I want to be able to have a sustained relationship and be able to serve this community as in, in whatever capacity I possibly can, given my obligations back home also. Some of you know that I have two kind of missions. I have a mission of Qur'an education and a mission of helping Arabic studies. You know, and that's the, that's the bigger one actually, that's the harder one. The short term is Qur'an studies. Long term, if we can educate the Ummah in Arabic the right way, man, we won't, you won't have to listen to me. You won't have to listen to like uh, me explaining the Arabic of the ayah. You'll already know it because you're a high school graduate. You know, that's, that's the state I want the Ummah to reach. And by the time our kids are teenagers, they know their stuff. Like they know it. They own it. You know? And they have so much confidence in Islam that when somebody makes a criticism of Islam, they don't just get angry for emotional reasons, they laugh because they can see how stupid their criticisms are. That's the kind of confidence I want to see in Muslim youth. I want to see Muslim girls in this country. So many women, mashallah, here wear the hijab with pride. It, makes, it really makes my heart melt. I'm a father of four daughters. It, it makes me so happy to see the kind of like Willing enthusiasm towards Islam our sisters have in this country. Really, I make so much dua for you. Every time I see a sister in hijab, and I see lots of them in the, you know, in the street walking around, I just make dua like, Ya Allah, bless these people. You know? Because that, this, is, this is something powerful. It's not something small. You take it for granted. The, the, the world is moving away from religion. You know that? It's moving away from religion. All religions, Islam included. You people have to... Hold on, and not just hold on, give a reason to, peop- give, to, give a reason, uh, to people to come back. And I keep repeating myself because I can't, feel, I can't tell you how strongly I feel about this stuff. I really, really do. So I leave you with lots and lots of du'as, and I'm hoping I leave with all of your du'as also, for ourselves, our team, all of our students that are trying to study as best they can, all the students that are trying to study this deen in any capacity, anywhere, you know, whether they're under myself or other shuyukh or other scholars, other institutions, we make dua that Allah produces people, leaders in this ummah that are worthy of being followed, that are sincere and genuine to the people, that are, that are open thinkers, that are critical thinkers, that are intellectual, that aren't narrow-minded, that give a reason, the, the ummah a reason to be united and not be more divided, you know? This is what we want in our ummah. And so I pray for all of that as I leave you. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.